My name is Elizabeth Sackler, and um, I'd like to welcome you to the second Elizabeth A. Sackler wild card uh, of 2009. And the wild card is an invitational event uh, bringing together the best and the brightest and the most important women to talk about the best and the brightest and most important issues of our time. The Elizabeth A. Sackler Center, as many of you know, because you come here fairly frequently, opened uh, two years ago. And we call for equality in art for wall space and for prices. Uh, we call for equality in culture and global consciousness and global conscientiousness. And I think um, since actually the center opened, we now have a wonderful new president and a wonderful new uh, group of people in Washington. So the, the thrust and the import with which I often say those words has now been moderated a little bit because I feel like we're making some headway and people are starting to open up and to discuss the very things that make us human and um, bring us forward in a world that is more just and equitable for all people. We are a center that's alive and vibrant and we have discourse about goals that we choose to name and the pain of the experience of suppressed people. And we're a center that's daring to challenge the status quo. That's one of the reasons that I really like the Brooklyn Museum. They're willing to status, the challenge the status quo along with us and to assert that creativity and education, tolerance and equality and respect and love must lead the way. Uh, if you haven't already been to the center uh, today, to see our most recently lauded, we got one, we received wonderful notices in the New York Times on Reflections of a Glass Mirror, New Feminist Video, and also Patricia Conan, uh, Harriet Hosmer, Lost and Found, and of course the Great Dinner Party uh, by Judy Chicago. I hope you'll take the time after our panel discussion uh, to do so. Today we have dads, dudes doing it. I love it. And the awesome women who are women, girls, ladies have dared to ask, uh, when are more men going to care about work, family balance, and what is the role of men in the feminist movement? And of course, those are questions that have come up um, all along, I think, over the last 30 years, and have certainly come to the fore again uh, since the center opened. And those are questions that, that come to me all the time and that come to the museum all the time. So it's going to be wonderful to have a whole other take and an opportunity to hear um, this great topic on the day before Father's Day, uh, 2009. And I understand Gloria Felt told me that uh, Time Out uh, said today was one of the top 10 things to be doing uh, on Father's Day. So welcome, fathers. Glad you're all here. And welcome, mothers. And welcome, children. There are a few. So that's great. Women, girls, ladies are the fabulous Gloria Felt, Deborah Siegel, Crystal Brent Zook, and Courtney Martin. And they tackle uh, these provocative questions from four generations. They're from four decades, as you will hear in a moment. And they've self-stated um, that they have wrestled and continue to wrestle with the men in their lives, fathers, partners, and sons, and with the men out in the world from Rush Limbaugh to Barack Obama. Uh, and I wanna know if everybody saw Courtney Martin wrestling with Bill O'Reilly <laughs> a few months back. It was really good. I've taken up boxing, Courtney, and I think that might be something to do before you go back on there again and give him a good job. Anyway, they're really ready to talk about these things, and I think they're really ready. They're going on the road. I, well, you've been on the road uh, to fix a lot of what is bothering um, us about these issues. So I would like to read to you their bios. Uh, Crystal Brent Zook is 42. Um, their, their ages are down by their choice, uh, by their own choice. So I am reading their ages because I think what's relevant about their ages is the fact that we have uh, generations, a span of generations coming together and that's part of what all this is about, um, is linking generations. So Crystal is an award-winning journalist whose work has appeared in publications such as Essence, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, the Washington Post, USA Weekday, uh, weekend, sorry, Vibe, Savoy, The Nation, and many others. 
She's the author of three books. Her latest is I See Black People, Interviews with African American Owners of Radio and Television to be published by The Nation uh, in February, I guess it's out. This is old, February 2008, it was last year. Uh, Crystal speaks regularly on popular culture and gender, multiracial identity and blackness, as well as social justice issues involving health, the environment, and criminal justice, all things that we all care about. She has appeared on national cable and broadcast outlets such as NPR, CNN, MSNBC, C-SPAN, MTV, Fox, and TV One, the major outlets, and is currently Associate Professor of Journalism at Hofstra University in Long Island. Um, Gloria Felt is 65, and she is an author, a commentator, and speaker. She is an expert uh, in women's rights, health, politics, media, and leadership from where the personal meets the political. She was a teen mom whose passion for reproductive justice led her to a 30-year career with Planned Parenthood Federation of America culminating as its national president and CEO from 1996 to 2005. And I say thank you very much for that work, Gloria. Gloria's forthcoming book in collaboration with Kathleen Turner is Send Yourself Roses. She has appeared on Hardball, O'Reilly, Today, Good Morning America, The Daily Show, Lara NewsHour, NPR, and the most major national news case. She has written commentary for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, USA Today, Huffington Post. It goes on. It's marvelous. And we're very lucky to have all these women. It's fabulous. She has been named uh, top 200 women leaders, legends and trailblazers by Vanity Fair. And I want to thank you very much for being with us today. Courtney Martin, 27. 27. It's a lie. She's 29. OK. She's under 30, and she's done more under 30 than most of us have done in twice as many years. She's a journalist, a filmmaker, and a teacher. She's written for Bust, Bitch, Newsweek, The New York Times, and The Village Voice, among other publications, and has been featured on The Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, PBS, 17, Glamour, Family Circle, and radio programs across the nation. Isn't this a great lineup? This is a terrific lineup. She's also contributing blogger to feministing.com. If you haven't gone on there, it's time to do it. Courtney is currently an adjunct professor of women's studies at Hunter College and lives in Brooklyn, New York. Her recently released book, Perfect Girls, Starving Daughters, The Frightening New Normalcy of Hating Your Body, was called a hard cover punch in the gut. I knew you were going to be a boxer <laughs> by uh, Huffington, and a smart and spirited rant that makes for thought-provoking reading by the New York Times. And Deborah Siegel is 38. Is that true or not true? That's not true either. These are obviously outdated. You must be 40. She's 40. We're two years off on these. Um, She's 40, and she's going to be a mother of twins in November. Yay, is right. Is a writer and consulting uh, specialist in women's issues. She's the author of the newly released book. It's not so newly released if this is two years off. Sisterhood Interrupted from Radical Women to Girls Gone Wild. It was in 2007 that that came out. She has written uh, about women, sex, feminism, family, and popular culture for magazines, anthologies, and on her blog, Girl with a Pen, and for the Huffington Post. In addition to writing, Siegel consults with organizations that link research on women's and girls' lives to media and policy, including the National Council for Research on Women, and the Woodhull Institute for Ethical Leadership, where she is currently a fellow. Are you still currently a fellow? She is still currently a fellow. She received her doctorate in English and American Literature from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2001. After today's panel uh, Q&A, uh, these four incredible authors are going to be giving a free book giveaway and signing their books outside in the hallway. So I hope that you will take a moment and um, pick up your copy and get it signed. And I think that's a very generous and wonderful thing. And I'm delighted, delighted to have you here. I thank you for accepting my invitation for you to come as my wild card. And please join me in welcoming these four great women, girls, and ladies. I asked Gloria where women, girls, ladies came from, and she gave me the first two verses 
of the country western song it came from, so maybe you can just do it one more time. Should I do the honors, Gloria? Go, go for it, Courtney. It's a country western song. There's women, there's girls, and there's ladies. There's no's, there's yeses, and there's maybes, which we figured was pretty representative of the contemporary feminist movement. Um, welcome so much. Thank you to Elizabeth Sackler, who is this incredible force, for those of you who don't know, in creating intergenerational conversations among feminists, in addition to creating this home for feminist art that I think we can all agree is a totally important, unprecedented um, sort of value for all of us. So I just want to give a big round of applause for Elizabeth Sackler. We also want to quickly thank Rebecca, Lindsay, all the team at Brooklyn Museum and the Sackler Foundation. You all have been so helpful putting this together. And we'd love to thank Vanya and Alex, who have been tremendous in helping us get the word out. So thank you to all of you. All right, so we're here today, as you know, to let's see if this is going to work for me. It's warming up, maybe. All right, I'm just going to talk. We're here today to reclaim the frame from feminist media, or from mainstream media, excuse me, which often pits women, particularly of different generations like us, against one another. Uh, when women disagree, it's a cat fight. Think about the mommy wars, for example. When men disagree, it's usually called a conversation. So, prepare to see us potentially disagree. We got it. Prepare to see us potentially disagree with the utmost respect for one another and our differences. We think that this is the stuff that progress is made of. In honor of Father's Day tomorrow, we're going to do something a little different than we've ever done before. We're going to focus on men and masculinity as, a, as it relates to the personal and the political in feminism. We feel that too often conversations about feminism are seen as solely conversations about women rather than as conversations about gender. We want to buck that trend today and really open the dialogue up to look at how we are all limited by restrictive gender roles and likewise all liberated by pursuing the still unfinished business of feminism. As we were looking forward to today's conversation this week, we paid careful attention to all the various messages about men and masculinity in the media. And I have to tell you, it feels like we're living in a pretty schizophrenic time in this regard. Um, just a few flashpoints from this week. Men's Health editor David Zizinko argued that men are, quote, an endangered species in an op-ed in the USA Today. I encourage you to check it out. Um, John Stewart and Mike Huckabee had a lengthy conversation about abortion on one of television's most popular shows. And just this morning, the New York Times reported that President Obama, who has a fascinating study in a sort of new masculinity, if ever there was one, attested that one of the best moments he's had since becoming president was going to a parent-teacher conference. That was pretty amazing. So this is the world we live in. Let's all try to make sense of it today. Um, we'd like to kick off the dialogue, which we fully expect you to be a part of, um, especially the men out there. We recognize that we don't really represent the full spectrum of gender up here. Um, we want to kick off this dialogue by really focusing on some personal stories because we really do try to live that mission of, you know, the personal as the political. And we designed our stories, um, which are very diverse, around these three questions. How were your ideas about men and masculinity formed while growing up? How did men shape your thinking about your own identity as a woman? And what is the role for men in the contemporary and future feminist movement? We're ambitious ladies, as you can see. These are pretty big questions. But we all tried to answer them in our own sort of personal ways. Um, and hopefully you can find some identification with one of us um, through that sort of personal conversation. After we each speak briefly, we'll launch right into our conversation. Um, we're also, as uh, Dr. Sackler said, going to have a few door prizes. We're going to sell and send books. We'd love to talk to you, so feel free to stick around afterwards. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. The first up is Gloria Felt. Thank you all so much for being here this afternoon. I was born into a man's world. I was born into the World War II cohort that was so small, it was called the ungeneration. My parents were children of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who settled in small Texas towns. My ideas about masculinity and femininity were formed in hard scrabble places 
that looked like the last picture show. Have any of you seen that movie? If you have, then you know it's about a small dying town in West Texas, and it's kind of a documentary of my life. I was Sybil Shepherd, but with dark hair. <laughs> the boys were the actors. The girls were the uh, scenery. This is my father. <laughs> Max stood six foot three. When he had a personality that was equally large, and the towns that we lived in were so small that the Postal Service once delivered a letter to me that said only to the eldest daughter of Big Mac, Stamford, Texas. <laughs> Family lore said that he roared after I was born, that prior to my birth, he had been bragging to everyone that he was going to have a son. Who said I wanted a boy, he said. He bought me this fabulous electric train when I was three. He took me on business trips. He often told me, you can do anything your pretty little head desires. His empowering advice, however, conflicted with everything I saw at home and in society. My mother's deference, the culture's low aspirations for women, the uh, June Cleaver or Marilyn Monroe images in the media, my mother actually ran the office in Daddy's Western Wear Company, but she felt powerless over her own life. I was mortified that she worked outside the home. My goodness, you know, June Cleaver cooked, sewed, and was home in the afternoon when the kids came home from school with cookies that she had made. My mother wasn't normal. Big Max was not normal. Like most adolescents, I just wanted to be normal. Well, I had bought the memo that was given to girls about what we should aspire to was marriage, babies, and young, by the way. Picket fence, and at all costs, hide your intelligence. Never be smarter than the boys. I became a teenage jelly woman molding my body and my personality to what I thought society, and most of all, boys wanted. Little did I know just how normal I actually was. This is me with my, youngest, with my oldest child. I became pregnant in 1957, which turns out to be the year the United States had the highest teen birth rate ever. I married my high school sweetheart. We were sort of like the, you know, the Bristol and Levi of the 1950s. <laughs> and we had our third child by just after my 20th birthday. To be fair, men's roles were also very limited. Like, they were like a penis and a paycheck. <laughs> The pressures of too young parenting and too low paychecks began to scare me. And despite wanting to be normal, I needed to earn money. Employment ads those days were sex segregated. Anybody remember that? I had no employable skills anyway, even for those girls wanted jobs. Miraculously, though, a new technology entered the scene just about that time. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> there you go. The birth control pill saved my life. It, it literally gave me a life. It let me plan a life for myself. It all happened um, and, and I started to college then when my youngest child was four years old. And it was in that, that wonderful, fermenty era of the 1960s social justice movements, largely led by men. Uh, I began getting involved in the civil rights movement. And as I worked for other people, I began to grow my own personal courage muscles. I realized as I was working for civil rights 
of African Americans that, you know what? Women deserve rights too. The political became very personal for me then when I couldn't get a credit card or a car loan without a male co-signer. And that, my friends, is when I became a feminist activist. This led me to my 30-year career with Planned Parenthood, and um, this photo was actually taken when I became national president. Those were my three children. Um, they all had those silhouettes done when they were in kindergarten. It's just one of my favorite, my favorite things that I have uh, of their childhood. I've had the privilege then of working for a world of planned and wanted children. I feel that nothing could be more important. I know from my own life that barefoot and pregnant are conjoined twins. And that reproductive justice is the most essential key to women's self-determination. Fortunately, I met a man who shared these values. Um, we're actually sharing wedding cake here. Um, that we actually bought, it's at our wedding brunch, that we bought at an ACLU auction, if that gives you a clue of how, <laughs> kind of how we are. Alex taught me a few guy things, too like how to interrupt Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> and that there is a time to march. You see, big structural changes can only happen when people join together in a movement. This is the front line of the March for Women's Lives in 2004. Bet some of you were there too. It was a place I never imagined I would be, let alone standing before all of you here at the Brooklyn Museum. Which brings me to the question of the role for men in the contemporary feminist movement. There is a stunning change that has happened between my father's generation and my son's generation. Feminism has without question changed men as much as it has changed women. Daddy coochie cooed the babies, but he never changed a diaper. My son, on the other hand, has been intimately involved with his children since the day they were born. As USA Today put it, there's a new daditude. <laughs> These are my adorable, brilliant grandsons. For them and their children to be, I want three things. First, I want men and women to join together in a new movement to change the workplace so both can have a life and earn a living. Second, I want this recession to become the transformational moment when we finally equalize gender power at home and in the workplace. And three, I want reproductive rights to be absolutely guaranteed as human rights. I know we'll succeed because my daddy told me we can do anything our pretty little heads desire. I remember my father's scent as equal parts tobacco, leather briefcase, and Aramis, that cologne that was named after the most gentle of the three musketeers. Like other liberated dads, living in the suburbs of Chicago where I grew up, whose wives were middle-class women who were newly awakened by the women's movement and heading back to school for advanced degrees, as my mother was. My father woke me up in the mornings and helped me get dressed and ready for the day on the mornings that my mother left before dawn. I am the daughter of a liberated man. My father was a nurturer. That's not him, that's my mother. <laughs> Who people say I look like. I don't know. <laughs> my father, when my mother was pregnant with me, planted a narcissus bulb in a race to see who would bloom first. I did. I won. He's a psychiatrist by training, and he worked part of the time in our home and part of the time downtown. And when adults would ask me in that knowing, testing way that adults have when I was a little girl, do you know what a psychiatrist is? I would reply with certainty, yes, it's like a mother. <laughs> and there it was, clear as a promise and solid as a stone. 
Growing up as part of the free to be you and me generation, we got a lot of you in the house, I see, yeah, free to be you and me. <laughs> I knew that daddies were people. <laughs> people with children. <laughs> they were nurturers, they were caregivers, to an extent. I still had the sense that mommies, even when they worked outside the home, still did the lion's share of caretaking. As a young adult at a large state university in the Midwest, I had the privilege of dating feminist guys. These were sons of feminists, and they were the kind of guys who walked in the back of the Take Back the Night rallies. I bet we have a couple of you in the front row. Uh, they were the kind of guys who volunteered in the women's homeless shelters, and they were the kind of guys who took women's studies classes not just to pick up chicks. <laughs> Although there were those two, I just didn't date them. <laughs> Raised by feminist moms, these guys were fellow explorers in helping us discover ourselves. They were allies, not enemies, in our own awakenings. But not all was complete, of course, in daughter of feminism land then, nor is it today. I wrote my last book, Sisterhood Interrupted, From Radical Women to Girls Gone Wild, because I wanted to understand how feminism had, in fact, changed women across the generations. And in that book, I argued that, yes, feminism clearly had changed women, since the radical women of my mother's generation threw out their bras and told men to stop pinching their asses and rallied for equal rights and equal pay, but that far more had stayed the same. And now, as, I, as my late 30s roll into my early 40s, I'm on my way to becoming a mother myself, and I'm starting to wonder, had feminism missed a beat? Had feminism forgotten to engage men? I'm writing my next book on this subject, but it's all very, very personal, as so much of feminism is for me. This is my partner, Marco. <laughs> He's dancing on the beach in, Port in his native Puerto Rico, which is where we got engaged. This is us at our Jewish wedding <laughs> in upstate New York. And I actually I have to pay homage to Dr. Elizabeth Sackler and the Sackler Center for Feminist Art because I had a very alternative bachelorette party instead of you know the normal or whatever the normal is these days. <laughs> I took my girlfriends to a private tour of the dinner party right here. <laughs> So we got married in July 2008, and in January 2009, my husband got canned. Joining, of course, men and many women, but mostly men, because women are cheaper, you know, we're easier to keep, um, in this great recession. In March 2009, we learned that I was carrying twins. <laughs> So full of expectation, hope, anxiety, fear, I did what feminists have been doing for decades. I started writing about it furiously. <laughs> and I started connecting my own personal experience to a larger political frame. This is um, a website called recessionwire.com where I write a column called Love in the Time of Layoff. <laughs> Recession Wire's tagline is the upside of the downturn. So what's the upside in being pregnant and having a laid-off partner, you might ask? And what's the downside of feminism's unfinished business around men? Crisis, I think, can be opportunity. During Marco's time at home, he's developed a newfound appreciation for the rhythms of domestic life. And we both sense that in certain ways, his values are starting to shift. Okay, in some ways, in some ways, both Marco and my father remain traditional dudes. This is my dad entertaining fantasies about being a pioneer. This is Marco, who still is very attached to his King Arthur days. This was a, a festival at the Cloisters where he got to dress up as a knight. But in many ways, both, both Marco and my father continue to evolve straddling new and old versions and visions of masculinity and as the world around them continues to change. The other week, for instance, after Marco had returned from buying me eggs on a very rainy morning, 
when I was in danger of throwing up <laughs> um, and really needed those eggs, he came back and I asked him, how do you think life might be different for us again when you find work once more? And this is what he said. Corporate life, he said, it takes you away from the eggs. <laughs> Being home, I feel more in tune with a much bigger timeline. I've gotten used to a life in which everything is attached to real values. You, me, these unborn babies, staying healthy, providing a life that's not just an income, but an organic whole. There's something in me when I heard that that felt so immensely relieved that Marco has had this time to commune with the eggs. <laughs> because the babies that are growing inside me need not just an involved father and not just a nurturer, but a fully committed partner, somebody who's willing to rethink his orientation toward work and family life. And this, I think, is something a lot of men are learning right now these days. The way we got here is not necessarily how I might have wished to have gotten here, but it's what we've got, and it's where we're at, and the feminist in me thinks it ain't bad. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I have to confess, on the day that I knew I had to write this talk, I tossed and turned all night long. Just before 5 AM, I dragged myself to my desk and started the dreaded task of looking for photos. I received my PhD from the University of California at Santa Cruz at the age of 27. That same day, I saw my father for the first time in my adult life. I had hunted him down, actually, using my investigative journalistic skills. And after some initial calls and emails, I decided to invite him to the big day. I didn't know my father at all growing up. He left unexpectedly when I was still a baby. Uh, he later confessed on my graduation day, in fact, that he, how much he had loved my mother. Well, that didn't do me much good, um, except perhaps to fuel my fascination with these fairy tale romances that had absolutely nothing to do with real life. It was a day of firsts. It was actually the first time that my mother and father had seen each other in more than 20 years. I think she handled it very well, um, considering. I grew up in an all-female, working-class, African-American household my mother and grandmother raising um, both myself and my cousin, who also happens to be biracial. This is us um, with our aunt. My mother and grandmother didn't have to say the words out loud. Um, the unspoken messages we received were clear. <clears throat> Men don't stay. Even if they do, they don't necessarily do much good. <laughs> These are just the messages that I heard, <laughs> not necessarily what they said or even what they believed. Um, but women are stronger. Women are better. They have to be. The few images we had of our fathers were fleeting, heartbreaking. They seemed so strong in their youth, so capable, so masculine. I couldn't figure out how was it possible that they couldn't take care of their little girls. For many, many years, I thought I had the solution all worked out. I would be strong. I would be a strong black woman who didn't take any shit from men. A relationship was a distant dream that I entertained only in private, um, usually while soaking up Jane Austen movies pride and prejudice and sense and sensibility in castles. And then something in me just shifted. I met a man for whom family, commitment, and fatherhood were the very foundation of his being. I was inspired. And by inspired, what I really mean is that 
He gave me uh, the courage to believe in the fairy tale and to believe that fathers possibly can and do stay with their little girls. This is my partner, Alfonso, who he works and lives with me here in Manhattan, but he also returns to Spain at least once a month to visit his little girl, um, who's here on the left, left with the glasses, and his um, niece in the middle. And even though he's been separated for more than six years from his ex-wife, he still has to fight. I know some men can probably relate to this, but has to fight for the right to be a father. Um, Spanish laws and customs are not so different from US customs and laws in that it's assumed in the courtroom and in the streets that women are somehow biologically inherently better caregivers. But even through this struggle, Alfonso has something that I didn't, his father. And the memory and reality of that ongoing support remains strong even today. I'm trying not to cry because I don't have the excuse of hormones, <laughs> but it's hard. <laughs> I believe that the future of feminism and men's role within families and relationships is profoundly influenced by our experiences as young boys and girls and that the expectations we have for these roles are based on the images we see or don't see before us. This is his daughter, again, with her little cousins, who live in New York, actually. For me, the very idea of having a stable father figure, a grandfather figure, in fact, on hand every day and for <laughs> long, intimate family vacations, was so foreign to my psyche that it actually stopped me cold the first time I experienced it, my first summer in Spain with Alfonso. Luckily, the future of men and feminism is not only determined by the past. More importantly, it's based on the strength of our desires, and I really do believe this, our desires right now, right here, today, in present time are more powerful than our past. So no matter how painful or delayed the process may be for us, we all have to face the day, men and women, when we decide that it's time either to reject past models or to embrace them. Whatever we decide, I believe that it's in this conscious choosing. This is what feminism was fought for, choice. So in the conscious choosing, we finally begin to build the foundations for our very own fairy tale castles. Thank you. Whew, that was beautiful, thank you. So I was born on the last day of the last year of the 70s. I was raised by not one, but two feminist parents. My dad retired from the All Men's Business Club downtown in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where I grew up, because as he said in the letter, and I remember this, reading this very well at 12 years old, I refused to belong to an organization that might one day welcome my son, but never invite my daughter. My mom started the longest running women's film festival in the world, while also being a clinical social worker and community activism. As you can see, feminism was the water I grew up in. But as I reflected for today's topic, I remembered that there are many ways to tell a story. In this case, in one version, I am part of the generation that inherited a world permanently altered by feminism, as Gloria put it. My father supported me in my athletics and academics, just like my big brother. I went to an all-women's college, excelled, go Barna. <laughs> Uh, stay tuned, I say some not so nice things later. Um, excelled, made a career for myself as a writer in the male-dominated landscape of opinion journalism. I bought my own apartment, I have my own money, I met a funny, artistic, sensitive man, and we have a relationship very much shaped by both of our expectations for equality and independence. Kind of a feminist fairy tale, right? 
But in another version, a more complete version, the unfinished business of feminism comes to light. I am part of a generation that inherited a world half changed by feminism, in my opinion. My father had high hopes of being an equal parent, but didn't fulfill a lot of his promises to my mother, and she didn't enforce them. His firm was rigid and demanding. My mom's career was so much easier to adapt. He was present, but my mom was definitely the primary caregiver. She did the typical superwoman juggle through the 80s and 90s. I was told you can be anything, but I heard you have to be everything. This mistranslation was in the modeling. My mom was absolutely amazing, but also overscheduled and exhausted. By the time I was in middle school, she had a chronic illness. My dad was successful in the world in very recognizable, obvious ways, and when he was home, he just seemed completely happy-go-lucky. The lesson? Femaleness is about dynamism and exhaustion, and maleness is about traditionally defined success and taking it easy at home. I went to that all-women's college, indeed, and in addition to being surrounded by the most amazing educated young women in history, I was also surrounded by anxiety and eating disorders, depression, sexual politics as antiquated and sexist as the 50s in many ways. My friends, the most liberated in history, were also raped, pushed by their boyfriends, starving, purging, often self-hating. I wrote a book about this paradox in Perfect Girls, Starving Daughters. I do have an incredible partner. <laughs> You're going to be kind of easy to spot now, my friend. Um, and we do aspire to have a relationship largely shaped by our shared feminist values. But sometimes he has to work really late at his demanding job, and even though I know it's his turn to do the dishes, I do them anyway. I try to resist that quintessentially female form of resentment, but I feel it creeping in. I wonder what it would be like to have kids someday, and like my parents be in a position where he has a traditional job, lots of responsibility and supervisors to answer to, and I have a flexible job and a penchant for taking responsibility for too much. I love my big crew of guy friends, but sometimes, this is them in their, in their natural habitat, this is really an authentic view of them, um, sometimes I see them interacting with one another, and it's almost as if they lead divided lives. On the one hand, they are much more comfortable being emotional than their own fathers were, much more vocal about their desires to be present fathers. On the other hand, some of them still make gay jokes, and they often seem to experience intimacy with one another through teasing. They don't seem to take on the issue of violence against women, for an example, as their issue, which I truly believe that it is. This version is no feminist fairy tale. There's so much work to do. Here are the few of my ideas to get started. This is another one of my guy friends in his natural habitat. Uh, <laughs> individual guys have to start striving for less divided lives making the courageous move to stop their friends from making gay jokes or talking about women as if they were just sex objects. This doesn't mean being humorless. It means being consistently accountable to your values and serving as a role model for other men. Guys need to understand that sometimes the internalized oppressions are the most intractable, the proverbial enemy within. Guys need to start working toward, together to end violence. Read Michael Kimmel and Jackson Katz. See Byron Hurt's amazing film, Hip Hop, Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Women and men need to work together on creating the infrastructure necessary for all of us to lead whole lives, characterized by fulfilling work and family lives. Moms Rising is this amazing force right now that's working to get the, the policy that needs to be in place for women and men to take paternity and maternity leave, you know, to get health care, to have subsidized child care, all of these critical parts of kind of the collective in infrastructure that we need to create. And I would love to see men take these issues on as their own, because till that happens, you know, the work-life balance issue will always be seen as a women's issue. Men must advocate for their own rights in workplaces as fathers and, you know, just people with lives outside of work, not completely identified with that paycheck. All of us have to work towards a healthcare system that doesn't leave women picking up the pieces when children and elders are sick. Women like myself need to hold our partners accountable to our parenting and household duty agreements. I feel like this is like the old paradigm. Um, we also need to trust, and I think this is, this is really important, we talk so often about, you know, where are guys, why aren't they picking up their part of the, the sort of slack, but I also think women need to be really conscious about the ways in which they interact with men around these issues. 
Um, I think we need to trust our partners to develop their own style of caregiving and cleaning rather than imposing our own. Um, our, part our partners, of course, need to follow through, not just pay lip service to their desire to share the load. Women need to remind themselves that there is courage in stepping back, letting go, giving up a little, a wisdom men seem to embody more readily. Men need to remind themselves that the deepest fulfillment in life is not found in bringing home a big paycheck or saving face, but in authentic relationships and the joy they bring, something I think women have known in their bones for years. This is my brother and my mom and I in Santa Fe in a snowstorm. These are some of my ideas. Mostly I've got a lot of questions. I'm living my way into the answers. And as you can see, having a hell of a time doing it. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? There are microphones on, on this side. There's a microphone on this side. We would love to know what you think. Tell us. Ask us. Disagree with Disagree us. Disagree with us. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful Father's Day gift. I really appreciate that mixture of wit and wisdom. Video as well as vocal. I can't thank you enough. The introductory comment about the purpose of the panel to challenge the status quo suggests what the status quo really is. And what occurs to me is the idea of Emma Goldman, who happens to be my favorite American political theorist and activist. Uh, for her, the status quo was, yes, gender, but also economic. And she felt that a liberal approach to changing the status quo was insufficient. Uh, she challenged the women of her time, particularly the suffragettes, and felt that voting, for example, uh, was only a sop. Uh, it had no real meaning. Uh, so she wanted to get to a radical approach to changing the capitalist structure. What do you think about that? Courtney. <laughs> oh, this is my dear mentor and political theory professor, so I am going to be in the position to answer the most difficult question. Um, I think that anything that creates a word that my brother taught me, disequilibrium in terms of gender roles and gender relationships and economic systems that sort of pressure us in certain directions. Um, both sort of fundamentally and socially is a good thing. But I have to say that it's hard from, one, th one thing that a lot of people say about my generation is it's very pragmatic. And I actually think that that's true to a large extent. And I think that pragmatism for me gets in the way of the idealism that would be necessary to believe that that's possible. So it feels more possible to, for example, as we were saying, take advantage of the recession as this moment where things are just kind of shaky enough that we can create change than to actually create a systemic change. Like that just feels um, overwhelming, like an, an overwhelming and sort of impossible idea to me in a lot of ways. As much as I love Emma Goldman or, or ideas about kind of looking at the ways in which capitalistic structure at heart has been a patriarchal structure, um, the like pragmatic part of me that has to wake up tomorrow morning and do something with my life feels like, let me just get the, the low-hanging fruit of change. I don't know if anyone else feels differently. Yeah, Gloria, go for it. Whoa, this is where you really see the generational difference, I think. I am <laughs> way more optimistic, and that might be a little odd. I mean, it might seem a little bit odd that I would be way more optimistic, particularly because um, I'm actually kind of obsessed with part of the question that you answered, because I'm currently writing about women's relationship with power and how it has changed and not changed over the years, in spite of some massive social changes. And uh, one of the things that, that, that we have seen is that th there have been these cycles in about 30 to 50 year cycles in which women have made big steps forward and taken sometimes bold leaps only to step back themselves. And just even the term suffragette instead of suffragist, um, which is really the 
the grammatically proper term, but suffragette got into the discourse and became, you know, et, you know, cute, aren't we cute? These little, you know, little women who want to vote. Um, and, and I think that is symbolic of the fact that what, what, what Emma Goldman was reacting to was that, that, that women had bought into the notion that if women could only vote, it wouldn't matter because they would just vote like their husbands, right? I'll ask the professor. And, uh, and that's what we have to guard against. And that's what, if we aren't willing to take some bold leaps sometime, um, we are in danger of, of moving back. You're either moving forward or you're moving back. And so when, when I talk about the personal being political, I see it as being a very purposeful thing, not just a reaction to a current crisis, but a very purposeful vision of, of the kind of future that we want. And then step by step, um, we have to break a few eggs to get there. <laughs> family that wasn't discussed, uh, which is looming for a lot of people who are in their, uh, uh, I guess, baby boomers, is the preponderant responsibilities that women have for, the, uh, for their parents in their transition to old age and um, uh, death. And that doesn't seem to have changed. It, when I was involved in that very much myself, uh, I would say three quarters of people, 80% of the people who uh, were involved were, were the, the daughters and not the sons in, in direct, uh, directly. And I was wondering if you see any hope, signs of hope for that changing among the younger women. Another question I have is that in a way, um, women have gained ground in the area of uh, getting jobs and indeed, Maybe we might say some of it was economic because they've had to get jobs. The um, fact of the matter is, to use a good male expression, uh, that uh, buying power of a male salary has declined so much in the last 30 years that women have had to work. It's not been a choice, but a necessity for more and more, even middle class women, as well as uh, working class women. And uh, the flip side of that is that feminism in providing so much support and encouragement of that, which I am a product of and am wholeheartedly in favor of, in a way devalued uh, the so-called stay-at-home mom. And I find it painful to talk to stay-at-home moms uh, who you know, often feel, express that kind of devalue, because it's, you know, that they de self-devalue. So I was wondering, you know, what, again, you, what hope you see on that horizon. And my third comment is that you guys didn't talk about sex and how sexuality has changed. And I was expecting to hear some of that. So I throw those, uh, those two well, you. Thank you. I know we'll get to the sex because we talk about it a lot amongst <laughs> ourselves and we're happy to talk about it here. Um, but I want to answer the first two questions, or take a stab. As Courtney likes to say, the model is, the message is in the modeling. And I have to say, um, speaking personally as Generation X, um, daughter of boomers, that my, uh, I lost both my grandmothers last year. I'm actually wearing a bracelet that belonged to each of, one of each of them. And I watched my parents take care of them, um, and one of those grandmothers ended up moving into my parents' home. And my father was the one who really invited her in. It wasn't his mother, it was his mother-in-law. Um, and watching the care that, and the nurturing you know, that he did with this older generation, I learned, and my partner learned. And I, you know, I think, again, the message is in the modeling the more we see boomer men taking care of their greatest generation parents, the more we Xers and Yers <laughs> you know, learn that that kind of caretaking is a man's job too. Uh, the second theme about stay-at-home mothers being devalued, was, that was the question. Um, I, you know, I think it's an interesting question 
Um, feminism and motherhood has been an ongoing conversation from the start, and I think much of what feminism has done is to support motherhood in all its forms. And um, one thing that I often find myself reacting to is the idea that ours is an opt-out generation, that we're all just leaving the workforce to become stay-at-home moms. As you mentioned, you know, dual earner families have been the norm in America since 1992. And so the idea that there is this exodus, you know, and there are more stay-at-home moms than ever is a myth. You know, I think we know by now it's, it's happening among a very thin slice of women, those who can afford to live on you know, their partner's salary. Um, it doesn't quite address the disparaging, but maybe somebody else wants to take that on. Well, I think there have been studies um, done that show it's pretty clear that young men, who, younger men who have been raised by single mothers have a very different attitude about you know, housework and, and um, relationships even than uh, men who haven't. So going back to that idea of modeling, I think that it's, uh, you know, even if they haven't been raised by single mothers, there has to be some sort of modeling or some sort of conscious framing of these issues for um, the generation that's, that's coming. And just to go back to my example of Alfonso, I think that uh, he's far more nurturing than I am. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's because of the modeling that he had in his family and far more nurturing of his now growing older parents, even calling them at least once a day uh, in Spain, sometimes more than once a day. Um, and this is not unusual, maybe for, you would say, maybe for Spanish people, but it is, actually. It's, it's unusual even for his own family. Um, and maybe that has something to do with him being younger and, and, and the modeling, I'm not sure. But the other question, I think I kind of lost track because that one was so provocative. Sex, let's go to sex. Uh, sex. <laughs> Sex, yes. Um, let's see. It's the doing it part of our title, dads, in a, dudes. In, dudes. in our last talk, sex actually came up more for some reason. We talked about how many of us are cougars. <laughs> <laughs> Two of us, I think. <laughs> but we can get back to that later. <laughs> I had another uh, comment on the G-rated side of things, which is, I, I think at the deepest level, this stay-at-home question, first of all, is a problem of language because I don't think, you know, as I said in, in the introduction, there's, there's really, that's sort of a media manufactured pitting against one another because so many women, like I even thought, I remember when I learned about stay-at-home moms and working moms, I thought, is my mom a stay-at-home mom? Because she didn't have a formal workplace that she went to and a lot of the work that she did was unpaid. So. I was very confused about what that even meant about my own life. And then I realized that the reason it didn't fit was because that language is not very helpful. That the majority of moms who might be framed as stay-at-home moms are community activists or doing all sorts of um, you know, consulting. It's, it's that we all live really interesting, complicated lives. And stay-at-home versus working mom is completely inadequate language to describe that. And at the, the most fundamental, that question is about fulfillment. I mean, it's about economics, but it's from a psychological perspective about fulfillment. And I think you know, books like Get to Work by Linda Hirschman, um, which you know, is very controversial, and you know, she's not the most empathic human being as I have experienced personally. Um, that book, in part, what I love about the book is it's about the fact that women, just like men, need to have intellectual and, and sort of career-focused fulfillment in some way. That looks different for all women, but I think that that's the part that maybe gets misconstrued in the media sometimes is that feminists are saying women have to work. When I, I would rather put it as feminists think women need to be fulfilled in whatever form that takes for them, which is you know where we get back to choice as usual. I wanted to invite, I know we have one special guest, special invited guest here. Do we have any others in the audience? No, who, I don't think so. Okay, so our, our, one of our special guests, Jimmy Briggs is here, who's an author who's written Come on, Jimmy. <laughs> Written on this subject, and um, we've asked um, a few people to stop by to share thoughts since they have experts. He's being shy. It's over. <laughs> um, since they have expertise, and, and particularly we have a man who's written on this subject and um, would like to share some thoughts with us. <laughs> and now he's leaving altogether. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Jimmy. Come back, Jimmy. Come back voice and I'm curious to just I wanted to bring into the room the perspective of queer women 
and also um, a perspective of, of single women, which some of you talked about the experience of having single moms, but just of the, the power or, or, or opinion and, and experience of single women. And um, I think sometimes the part of the feminist uh, fairy tale is finding this male partner to support us as women. Uh, which still relies very heavily on finding a partner, which is part of the, the mystique of, of fairy tale narrative. It doesn't get us out of that Beauty and the Beast box, right? Um, and, and find the Prince Charming. Maybe the Prince Charming's uh, uh, resume has just changed a bit. <laughs> so I, I wondered if you could comment on your... Um, just on that broader broader view of, of your maybe relationship to queer women's movements and, and narrative within the feminist movement and just a, a need for a, a kind of a gender evolution 2.0 of sorts uh, of really embodying feminine and masculine characteristics. Yeah. I, I would like to just take that one on because I so identify with what you're saying and so many parts of me were conflicted for a long time about um, what, what I like to see now as the imbalance within me of yin and yang. You know what I mean? The masculine and the feminine. And I have to bring it there to a personal place just because I think that my feminism was like that picture. It was totally out of balance. And I think that that's the stereotype of feminism. And so this is the part that should generate a lot of controversy and disagreement, which we like, because I fit the stereotype. You know, no, don't help me, I can do everything. You're just, you're just in my way, you know? And I think that that has to be, you're saying let's talk about single women. Well, as a former single woman, that has to be part of the conversation is that change is within us too. It's not just, it's, it's men, but it's not just waiting for that Prince Charming and it's not just not waiting for that Prince Charming. It's also finding out where's the balance within us and within our own feminism. Um, if that makes sense, that's, mm -hmm. that's how I come at it. I just, I want to add too, you know, I think we're living in a moment where Prince Charming has been laid off, you know, <laughs> metaphorically as well as, you know, pragmatically in a lot of respects, but um, there's a new book out by uh, a dear friend of mine, it's actually called In Her Own Sweet Time, Unexpected Adventures in Finding Motherhood, Commitment, and Love, and not, it's a book that chronicles her own personal experience and it also does a lot of work of investigative journalism. I think that um, that as you know, I mean, I'm I've become very interested in in um, this group called Single Mothers by Choice, and I'm very interested in the new configurations through which women are forming families, queer women as well as straight women on their own. I think we're living in a in a moment where the norms are, be, you know, the, the kind of popular perceptions around single motherhood are ever so slowly beginning to shift, and I find that um, exciting in certain ways and liberating. Right, I also think you and I have had conversations about this, but one of the really, I think, truly exciting and interesting things about the younger generation is all the studies done about sexuality, here we're getting to sex people, um, that show that more women identify as being on a spectrum of sexuality as opposed to, you know, heterosexual, homosexual, and not even using the word bisexual because that also I think feels very limiting for people and I really identify with this idea that, you know, and I think it would be, I haven't read the studies on how men identify, I think men are still feeling pretty clearly in one category or the other, but there's just a, a wealth of research now that shows that this sort of spectrum of sexuality is really alive for young women today. And Oprah and, even said it, so that solidifies Yes, it. Oprah even <laughs> said it, can you believe it? Um, and, so, and so I think that there are a lot of interesting questions that come up around that spectrum in terms of the way it destabilizes what we understand about you know, courting one another, or whether people are straight or gay, or how to create relationships around those different times of our lives, and I think it's like a really wonderful destabilization. I'm really excited about it. My, mine was the generation that that created such uh, comments as "I am my ha I'm my own handsome princess," um, you know, "a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle," things like that. So, uh, I mean, that's, it's like, it, it had to be an awakening of recognizing first that, that I am a whole human being. And, and it seems to me that, that that is the first and essential matter that has to be, that has to happen or be sought or to be the opportunity provided for 
any human being, uh, whatever sexual orientation, whatever uh, other characteristics that we, we might have, that's just like the most essential thing. And for so much of human history, that has not been the case. And I think we live in very exciting times. Um, actually, the last time we were on stage together, um, I believe, the la no, the next to last time we were on stage together, um, we, we had a, a um, uh, one of the uh, individuals on the panel was a lesbian, and she was about nine months pregnant, and there was a total discussion of her life, her motherhood, her partner. No one asked, no one assumed. It, it was, I thought it was magnificent, and I, I would like to say in, in, in conclusion, however, that I think your point is very well taken about the makeup of this panel, and that we should, I think, make that point um, at the beginning, that we recognize that this is a heterosexual panel. That is, that is absolutely, I think, a fair challenge to us. But we do mix it up, you know, sometimes yeah. one of us will step out and mm -hmm. someone else will step in when we can't all be here and we try to really bring in kind of, you know, the diversity that we don't represent ourselves when that happens. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me um, to be here. Uh, well, the book that you're referring to, it's actually, um, I should be working on it now and I'm not working <laughs> on it as much as, I, as much as I am. But, uh, you know, it's for me to come in and hear you all speak, it's, uh, it's very, uh, you know, it's very provocative for me. It's, it caused a lot of personal reflection, just hearing your individual stories, uh, particularly about um, men who, who aren't there, and men who bother to go away, because it's something I grapple with continually. Uh, the book that I'm writing, it's actually, um, putting in my journalist hat, it's a book about women around the world who stand up in the face of gender violence, whether it's in war, whether it's cultural, cultural with honor crimes. And the book, it's a series of letters to my daughter because um, yeah, I am divorced, but I'm in her, in her life trying to co-parent her. And about a year ago, a year and a half ago, she confronted me when she was six and said, why do you go? Why do you leave me all the time? And so for me, it caused this profound period of reflection, like why am I choosing to go focus on other people's kids or other women and girls, and I'm not staying around to, uh, to be fully present for my own child, which is why that's the motivation for the book. But um, I, I guess, you know, in many ways, for me to be here again, it's humbling, um, because I, I really feel like, if I can speak individually as a man, I feel like I'm very much an accidental advocate around, this, around the issue of gender and gender justice. Uh, it's because of having a daughter, but also because of what I saw as a journalist in the field. Um, presently, right now, and, and Gloria, whom I've yet to meet directly, but Crystal, who knows me, um, I've been working for the past almost a year now, working with a coalition of organizations in this country and abroad uh, to, to bring together young people globally to act against gender violence in their communities. It's called Man Up. And next year, during the World Cup of Soccer in South Africa, we're bringing 200 young people from 50 countries to Johannesburg for a summit which will launch a five-year campaign um, around gender violence. And so, you know, for us, for me, my personal experience, and I'm very new to this conversation, I think um, the missing component, which someone, I think maybe Courtney referred to it earlier, is the presence, presence of men and boys in the conversation. I think um, too many men, whether you're generation X, Y, or boomer, or whoever, don't, we don't, amongst ourselves, we don't talk about sexuality or, or, or we don't talk about these issues in a very real way. And we're particularly on the issue of gender violence, um, we don't consider it to be our issue. It's very much a woman's issue, whether you're talking about it here or internationally. And I think until more men, until, we, until more of us talk about, about these issues amongst ourselves, but also talk about it with women, with girls, um, it's gonna be difficult to move the conversation forward. Yeah, I th thank you so much for your for your work and your comments about it because I think that and Courtney brought it up earlier. The violence question is so huge. I'll just put in a a, a little plug for an organization that I've worked with. Um, the Family Violence Prevention Fund is doing amazing work on that front too in terms of um, a campaign called Coaching Boys into Men, and it's coaches. Um, high schools across the country having conversations with their teams about violence against women. 
which they found to be the most effective because the coaches have a different kind of interaction than parents or teachers. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that, and the work that you're doing, it's so encouraging to see men taking it on, you know, as their issue. I think it reminds me also of a conversation I've had with a couple of my guy friends um, around the, even the statistical stuff with, you know, that it's obviously a very difficult statistic to confirm, but, you know, chances are one out of four women in her lifetime will be sexually assaulted in this country. One out of four women, right? Which is wild. So even if it was one out of eight, even if it was one out of ten, having a conversation with my guy friends around, have you ever had one of your guy friends admit to sexually assaulting a woman? Have you ever had a conversation with a guy about this going on? Because I've had conversations with friends who've been raped and sort of where, how do we create more of those kinds of conversations? Obviously prevention is the key, but it just sort of blows my mind that there's a flip side of that equation that just never gets discussed um, or seems to never get discussed among men. Well, I, I always challenge you know, the guys, the men in my life, whether they're friends or family, you know, because people often ask, people have been asking me more and more lately, why do you even care about this issue? Why, you know, why are you focusing on gender? Um, what's your ulterior motive? And, um, you, know, I, you know, I always counter, you know, every, every male in my life, I always, the first thing I ask them when they, when they confront me is, you know, who do you know in your life who has been assaulted or victimized or targeted in some way for discrimination or violence? And every, every male I know, has at least one person. I mean, you can't not have someone in your life who's been a target of this. Um, so you just, I just take it to the personal level and go from there. I think also, too, and I, and I missed the, the very beginning, so you may have talked about this, is um, more candor around race, culture, and class, and, and how that, because even in the conversation we're having here in this, in this space, um, it's a very di different issue in the rest of America it's a very different issue, a very different perspective in Europe and Africa and other places. So just you know, how, we, you know, how we can tackle it, you know, go beyond you know, our, our geocentric or our class-centric perspectives. You know. Can I ask, um, how do you think would be the best way to start the conversation with, with men and boys? I mean, it's not hard to get women to come and talk yeah. about these things. And I, I always laugh about when we get our um, feedback forms at the end, uh, you know, a, a man's will say, good. And, you know, a woman will write us like a page of her thoughts about what we talked about. So help us out here. I mean, what, what do you think would start the conversation? I, I think, and again, speaking very broadly, I think it's very difficult to, it's very difficult for women to reach men on this issue. That's just the bottom line. I mean, there's, there's a layer of defense that's up, whether you, no matter how open you think you are as a man, it's up. Um, I think men and boys respond to their peers. You know, we have to have the conversations amongst ourselves. You know, like I was thinking about that picture Courtney had with the guys, you know, <laughs> drinking the beer or whatever. Like, it, you know, it's a social situation that's loose, but in those, and that's a situation where there has to be space to talk about it, you know, um, a, a, a place of comfort, but also of honesty, and you know, again, within ourselves, it's hard for men to be honest because of how we define masculinity. You know, if, if you're seen as being soft around women's issues, um, your masculinity is questioned. You know, so it, even then, amongst ourselves, it's not an easy task. But I think more men and men have to to engage other men, and I think we have to start young. We have to start talking to boys at a very early age about these issues. So that they grow up with a certain perspective. Thank you. It also feels like there's something around individual integrity versus group integrity because I feel like individually, the guys I meet have you know a tremendous amount of sort of feminist identification, even if they wouldn't use that term, and integrity around you know LGBTQ issues and gender violence and all this stuff. But that there's a group integrity, and I know Michael Kimmel writes about this really well in Guyland, yeah. kind of this idea of what happens when men get together. Right. that doesn't allow for that individual integrity to always be expressed fully. Well, you know, just again, my journey in this area has been a very recent one. But just, and I, don't, I know Michael Kimmel well, but in talking to he and others, and just talking to young men, uh, regardless of uh, class or, gender or race, um, it's, um, 
the, I understand what you're saying about integrity, but a lot, a lot of guys, a lot of men and young men will also always say, you know, I'm a good guy because I don't hit women or I don't hit my girlfriend or I, I don't call them certain names. But, I, you know, I, I think, and many of it, Michael is one of those people who think that just because you don't do something doesn't make you a good guy. I mean, not raping someone doesn't make you a good person. Um, I think, you know, the issue of integrity, you know, is important when you can actually stand up in the group or, or in beyond your group and, and, you know, and, and sort of check someone for using a certain slur name or when you step in when you see a certain abuse happening or escalating to a point where there could be abuse where you actually prevent it or halt it from happening. I mean, that, that's, that's being a good guy, going beyond, well, I'm not doing it, so I'm, you know, that's not me. That we have to get past that point as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank and I just want to throw in another, you know, kudos to you, Jimmy, for your work. And I also want to mention another book by Shira Tarrant called Men Speak Out, which is a really wonderful anthology. Her most recent one is called Men and Feminism. I really highly recommend them both. Speaking of forms, we, had, uh, we have forms for you to fill out, and we also have a giveaway. I don't know if one we have the, the cards. Oh, I'm sorry, one no, more? Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, we have one more question, and one then we question? can do that. OK. okay. All right. From Tristan. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was going to be the big ultimate question. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name Pressure. is um, Tristan Aaron, and I work at the Women's Media Center, so I was privileged to know that this was going to happen for a little while before it happened. And I just w was moved to come up and, and share something and ask you something about it, which is that I felt personally um, some dread as this event came closer to, like you did, Crystal. Um, and I appreciated what you, what you said so much, because I also didn't know my dad at all. And I realized the reason I had this anxiety, I guess, about all that being brought up in this context of feminism is that when I was a young feminist in my teens and 20s, was very much of a firebrand. And people who knew me well often said, oh, well, do you think this has something to do with your dad or your daddy issues? And I always said, no, of course not. What are you talking about? It's a political philosophy. Why are you diminishing my intellectual commitment, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but as I've gotten older, um, I've, I mean, I've definitely come to integrate the different pieces of my experience more and reflect on all the parts that made me who I am. Um, and I, so I wanted to ask you, do you think that this is kind of an intergenerational reaction. I mean, do you think it's possible that feminists of one generation are more comfortable drawing from their personal experiences and acknowledging the role of that in developing their identity as feminists? Mm -hmm. And maybe coming down the road, women feel like it's less valid or it's less, um, it's delegitimizing in some way to acknowledge yeah. that you have some personal history that informs your pol political mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's such an interesting, oh, question. Yeah. interesting yeah. question. It's come up a lot as we travel and with some of the uh, different responses we've got. Cor Courtney can attest to that from certain camp of feminists who don't agree at all with us talking about personal. You know, I have to say, when I was writing Sisterhood Interrupted, I was thinking a lot about these different generations and how different generations come to feminism. Um, and I think it's actually a truism that each generation comes to it through a very personal way and that personal stories remain at the center of the feminist narrative. The stories are different, but we're still needing to hook that personal into the political to have that click moment, mm -hmm. um, as I know Courtney is doing a lot of thinking about too. So I think that's actually one of the through lines rather than a disconnect, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what others think. Courtney. Yeah, I, I usually feel like our generation gets criticized for being too personal. Mm -hmm. That like our version of feminism is about aesthetics and about body image and you know, the controversy Chris was referring to is that one philosophy professor in Michigan basically like eviscerated me and said, I hope you won't talk about body image. Um, <laughs> I think that in my experience, young women, young women's sort of version of feminism often gets typecast as only personal, that we don't recognize the political or the collective or the policy or, you know, all the other stuff that needs to go on. Um, but I also feel like sometimes I, ha I like feel a bit, which is why I'm so honored to be on the panel with Gloria, that we have to sometimes drag personal stories out of older feminists to really understand 
what they experienced. And Gloria and I met actually because I interviewed her. She got an award and I was asked to interview her to get her bio. And I was so floored after meeting her and hearing her personal story. And I thought, you know, why isn't this happening more often? I feel like maybe older women sometimes think we don't want to hear their personal stories because it will sound like the, like, I trudged through the woods in six feet of snow thing. Um, but I think most young women are actually really hungry for those stories. So that's where I see sometimes a disconnect. I don't know if Gloria, you have. So um, I, I wish I could describe to you Courtney's eyes when I told her that there was a time without birth control pills. <laughs> It's <laughs> like, what? <laughs> um, I, I think, Tristan, that, that what you raise is, is, I, is something I think about all the time, and I don't know how to do it, but I often feel like the, the generation of feminists that, and I wasn't one of the, I would say I wasn't one of the first feminists, I was just an early adopter, um, but I think we did a lot of good things, but one thing that we didn't do very well is we didn't transmit the power of sisterhood, the power of just sitting around and telling those stories, the power of, I mean, the wonderful things that happen when you, when you do share those kinds of experiences and stories. And therefore, what happens is I think that women tend to isolate and we all feel like it's our problem that we have and we have to solve it ourselves. And so, um, I mean, that's why I think women's history studies are so important. That's why I think just uh, being able to have venues like this to talk about these issues is so important because, I, I, you, you know, when you're, when you're on the front lines of a big battle, sometimes you just have to suck up a bunch of emotional stuff and go do it. And, um, and yet, I think, as everyone else has said, when it really comes down to it, it is the personal stories um, and while I'm often I am often told that it's old-fashioned to keep harping on how the personal is political and the political is personal I don't care I say it anyway <laughs> so <laughs> I is. really believe it harp yeah, away right. Gloria yeah. harp away so thank you well, thank and oh we you. have one more okay one all right more okay I was Ooh, going to I can guarantee final it's closing be good. here but no <laughs> I just thought it would be worthwhile trying to get one more male voice in the conversation yes. about masculinity. Um, Are you going to talk about sex? Uh, I'll try to do that as well. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, so you've been talking a little bit about how do you get men involved in the feminist conversation. I just wanted to try to challenge that language a little bit, I guess, because I think in it is a potentially really serious problem for some of these issues, which is that we've bracketed issues that affect all of us as women's issues. So I'm thinking about, through this conversation, two of my best friends, one of whom, they've both been in long-term relationships seven, eight years, they're thinking about families, they're thinking about, you know, the rest of their lives, and they both, <laughs> in a very sort of unmasculine way, although they would never describe it this, they, they both are not, uh, they don't love working, right? <laughs> they would love to figure out how to have a life where they work as little as possible, right? Now, it, I actually it, know a lot of guys like this. Right. So, you know, but part of the problem is you start talking about life, work, uh, you know, family, work, balance, and no, no, those are women's issues, right? Or when you, you know, the classic one I think is around choice, which has been bracketed as a women's issue, right? This, you know, I think was Professor Dalton's part at the beginning. You start talking about families, who's going to work, who's going to support kids. These are, these are just issues that come up, and how do you figure out how to build a life together? But no, we bracketed, you know, family leave as a women's issue. So I think that part of the problem is how do we begin to think about some of these issues that through the, you know, achievements of the, of the feminist movement have become feminist issues, but in a way that then sort of, there's some ownership around that. Right? There is a giving up of power and control and voice around these issues that is going to be part of making them broader. So it's not just, you know, how do we get men talking about abuse, but if we're going to start talking about family leave as not a women's issue, then it means that it's not, you know, just the sort of territory of, you know, now or you know, all the other sort of, you know, quote unquote, women's advocacy organizations. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the problem is just thinking about how do we get men into feminist issues. That in and of itself, I think, really limits the way that we're talking about some of these concerns. I think concerns. that's a great point. I really thank you for raising that. And I think we have a language issue here. You know, I think we need to invent some new language because all the research is showing, all the data says that men of a younger generation, of your generation, would be willing to sacrifice 
pay and promotion if it meant that they could spend more time at home with their families, which is good news. And yet, we have that reality on the one hand, and then the other reality that even in companies that offer paternity leave, very few men take it. So I think the question is, how do we put language out there, make these not just women's issues, and make it okay in our culture for guys to take family leave? Because I think there's a larger stigma that's still attached to guys who want to be stay-at-home dads. And I was also thinking on that point that I think what Gloria was saying about women have seen their issues as personal, like in a silo rather than seen as collective. I think these guys that we're talking about also see this as a very personal issue rather than seeing it as something that they could collectively organize around and do something about. But I would like to turn it back to you to ask, like, what do you think could be done then? Because we're feminists. We're going to be labeled that way no matter what. So, like, what could we do to support men even if it's not called a feminist issue, we don't care what it's called, but what can we do to support men to organize around those issues? Well, I mean, I think, again, it's a language question, right? How do we talk about family economics, right? I mean, that, uh, that's something that everybody in my, you know, I'm 31, I mean, that's what people are thinking about. Mm -hmm. Who's, who's going to be around to raise the kids? How do we begin to, you know, my folks who are here bought a house uh, when they were my age for $27,000, right? And three blocks from the beach in, in California. I mean, even if you do all of the inflation, right, that's, that's so far out of the possibility of imagining for me and most of the folks that are my age. So beginning to figure out how do we talk about these issues in, 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 you know, in a language that is encompassing of not just, okay, how do men organize, organize around the men concerns and women around the women's concerns, mm -hmm. but begin to think about this as issues that are just about how do we begin to create the kind of lives we want to live. So I don't have any great answers, you know, but to something that's been ringing in my head through this conversation. It's awesome. Thank you. Insert myself here because I think that's terrific. Where are you? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's absolutely right, and it will mean we have to give up a little bit of ownership. Won't be right. my kitchen anymore. But huh? boy, wouldn't we be happy to give up a little bit of that ownership and share it? And thank you, thank you very much. It's terrific. I was thinking about a couple of things to drag in uh, a sled. In 1966, when I was in my freshman year of college, I was at a, a dorm party, a, a male. Well, it wasn't a dorm party; it's off-campus housing party. And there were uh, all of us, and there was a lot of beer drinking, and I was standing in a hallway talking to a guy, and there were a couple of other people standing around, and there was a door there, and the, the door kept opening and closing, guy kept coming out, and another guy would go in, and a guy, another guy came out, and another guy went in. And it was going on for about 10 or 15 minutes, and frankly, none of us were paying a whole lot of attention. And finally, I said, um, why are people going in and out? of the door like that. Why, are these, why is everybody going in and out? And they said, oh, so-and-so's in there and she's really drunk. So we're just having a little fun. Well, I have to tell you, and this is where I bring in the grandma sled, uh, it never occurred to me or to any of the other girls, and we were girls, we we're 18, who were there to be appalled, to be angry, to stop it, to get in the way. Because that is what was going on over and over again. So that's just a little more history for you to add to that. And that's sort of a downer after this wonderful, <laughs> this wonderful thing. So I um, bring it back to you and 31-year-olds and buying houses by the beach. I think that's a much better way to end. And also <laughs> on Gloria Steinem, who has been saying all along that, uh, well, actually, before I say what Gloria Steinem's been saying, I have to say what I've been saying to Gloria Steinem, which is to thank her for my daughters and my granddaughters for all of the work she's done. And um, I was introducing her and doing a conversation with her uh, in March out in New Mexico. And when that was all finished, I suddenly realized that I have continuously forgotten to thank her on behalf of my son and my grandsons as well, because, and because I, I think that the women's movement has opened that door. It has begun that wedge. But as Gloria says, until we have a men's revolution, we are not going to, all of us, be fully liberated. And I think the goal here, as you have pointed out, and as I think we're all working towards, is liberation for all people and that we can all work and live and be together in ways that are fruitful 
and supportive for one another. I want to thank all of you. This was a marvelous panel. Thank you. And I hope you'll come back again. Thank you very much.